Thanks very much for joining us for episode 28 of InTech Freight and Logistics, the podcast. I'm Kevin Baxter, and I'm joined by my co-host for this edition, InTech CEO, Rick Lagore. On this episode, we begin 2024 with a look ahead. It's been a couple of weeks since the ball dropped, signifying a new year, but we're all still in prognostication mode when it comes to the freight industry. What does 2024 hold and what lessons can we learn from last year? Rick and I will have a chat about just that. So without further ado, let's get started. So Rick, as we start the new year, let's let's first do the the look back before we look forward. So Makes the, sense. yeah, the final probably not final, but one postmortem on 2023 in freight. We know going into the year we had certain expectations don't think those expectations quite lined up with uh, with how it turned out. So how was 2023 compared to those expectations? Well, the expectations, I think we fell into the same same kind of group think that a, a number of other analysts out there were thinking. And the part that we all basically fell down on was we thought that you know, the second half of 2023 was going to be starting to be on the recovery side of the freight recession that started in July of 2022. Looking back and may, falling into that that group thing type thing, I, I'm kind of disappointed in myself and in planning that direction because <laughs> um, after coming out of crazy wild historic highs for a couple years, to think that we would get out of and, and come out on the other side and not have a longer down period than what we've had in previous freight recessions and, and in other ones are and I guess I don't like to call it recession I, let's let's call it uh, freight downturns. You know, they last anywhere from 8 to 18 months is kind of what we've seen over the past several years or actually past several decades. And that is just coming out of you know, just normal freight cycles. So to come out of, you know, crazy, crazy times to think it was going to be recovered within 12 months is, well, we'll, we'll consider that crazy thinking. Yeah. And so that's that's the part that I think everybody really missed because there were so many that were saying, well, second half, second half. And in terms of the other things that were out there that were were kind of sort of missed, fuel, actually, well, I'll put that under a surprise. Mm-hmm. And the surprise on that side is, is fuel went down, you know, almost 15%. Yeah. And a lot of the thinking was is uh, because of the war in Ukraine and, and, and just regular issues regarding fuel, the thinking was that that was going to remain, you know, fairly constant, maybe down a little bit. And with the potential of it being increased because there was really a a buy in the market or that would or the United States had drained a lot of the the reserves to try to hold fuel down when it was uh, high. Yeah. yeah, when it was super high during the pandemic. And the thought was is that there's gonna be a there, there's a floor of support that's gonna be put in there and the US is gonna go in and, and buy some. And as they go in and buy to replenish the the reserves that that was going to at least keep a floor in. But clearly I mean, they did buy, do some purchases, but the, the floor that we were expecting to be there was not there. Yeah. I mean, it kind of did its own cycle thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so th- which, uh, which was more, you know, in some ways in line with some historical stuff where every time it looks like it's going to stay high, it decides, eh, you know. Yeah, we'll go. No, it's we'll, it's we'll got go a mind of its own. And, and a lot of times you just, you, it, it's really hard to, it, to understand the fuel situation because of, because of oil. And you just don't know when there's going to be some political unrest in the in the Middle East, and that's where we're at now. Yeah. Um, so then we're thinking that okay, well, fuel's going to go up, but then you start to think, well, let's uh, let's look back and see what, what's happened previously. It's just a hard thing to get a hold of because you just don't know when someone's going to go ahead and and make a change in terms of their aspirations in a particular region of the country. Mm-hmm. So I'd fall. That, I'd put that under a surprise, and then as again, that it was it was down for 2023, and it was down quite a bit more than what a lot of people are expecting. The market overall, or or diesel? Uh, let's go <laughs> back. On, both. Actually, both. <laughs> but uh, the market overall is is the one that is is the one of biggest concern with so many freight carriers out there, or freight providers out there, but one that the shippers have enjoyed in terms of price and, and capacity. But on the flip side of that, if price and capacity are solid for them, that also means that their business is probably not in the level that they want to be right, because yeah. they're because the overall market demand for freight isn't where where everybody would like to see. 
Yeah, it's all all connected, obviously. Yes. If the, the volume's not there, that means their volume's not there either. So, right. yeah, same problem. Yes. <laughs> so the diesel relationship, before we leave that one, what did that do to the, the market? You know, coming into the year, the, the expectation was diesel was going to be higher. So what was that role in maybe hitting hitting the freight market as well, staying lower than it was? Well, that ha- that was... Uh two prongs of, of help for, for shippers in terms of keeping their rates down. Mm-hmm. So they, they were able to see rate decreases on the line haul side of over 20%. And so on the spot market, and then to go ahead and add into that another, you know, 14, 15% uh, decrease on diesel, that was a significant savings for them on, on overall cost as compared to their, you know, their sales that they have. The percentage definitely went down and, and it was favorable to them. Yeah. On the other hand, I mean, it sort of kept some people afloat maybe in the uh, the carrier side a little bit longer as on well? The, on the carrier side, yes. It's, a, it's definitely helped keep people afloat. But as we saw on the second half of 2023, we started to see more people uh, or companies, I should say, depart the market. And it's not just on the small carrier side. And I think we'll get into this a little bit more, but we're also seeing the larger carriers as well as larger brokerages, in particular the large brokerages that were really dependent or or their sales pitch to their investors was uh, electronic freight brokering and, and electronic load matching, which that uh, that has really come into to play in discussion as of late. Yeah. So last thing on the diesel side, one of the things that, that we saw over the course of the year, uh, another contributor to the, the freight cycle was for a while, I mean, now we have, as you said, gotten into this phase where a lot of carriers are unfortunately exiting or jobs are being lost. But earlier on in the year, that didn't happen as maybe as quickly as people thought it was going to the contraction a little bit in terms of the supply side of freight. Right. And it still hasn't moved quite as far down as what people would have expected. And uh, there's a couple of reasons that are being put out there for that. One is, is that, again, going back to the pandemic, two crazy wild years in terms of profitability for them, constantly running their trucks, very few empty miles, which helped their balance sheets and their financials to allow them to stay in the market longer. And then mm-hmm. the other part is, is that the broker's over the pandemic period have done a a lot of alignment and allegiance with particular small carriers that serve them very well. And they maintained volumes to those carriers that did really well for them in preparation for, you know, the next upturn in freight, which freight is a cycle. So that dedication that some of the brokers had for their, for their really dedicated and strong asset providers that helped keep those people in play for longer than what typically happens in uh, or what has happened in prior cycles. Mm. So speaking of the cycle, now that uh, we're into 2024, just a little bit, where would you say we are in the cycle now? I mean, we talked a few different times last year about reaching that bottom phase. Are we there? Are we starting to climb out of it? Or are we still hanging in the bottom? Is there any chance that we could go lower? Where are we at? Our thinking right now is, is uh, yes, we're in the bottoming phase, and the bottoming phase, actually, we're looking at it in two different ways. So the bottoming phase in terms of volume, I think we're basically there right now. But even though we're there right now, that doesn't mean that we're thinking that recovers anytime soon. Mm-hmm. So as, as we prep and as we talk with other carriers and other customers, that's basically what they're looking at as well. Volumes are down. But... One of the typical parts that happens at a bottoming process is that the recovery, once you hit the bottom, tends to bounce up a little bit faster than what we're expecting in the volumes. But what we are seeing is that on the right side, the rates are starting to inch themselves back up again, even though there isn't a, a support of volume that we typically would need to see start to increase as that supply and demand is out there in, in the freight world. And really what we're seeing is that the carriers that are staying in business have found that their cost of doing business is more expensive. And so, therefore, their rates, we've, we've gone as far as we can go in terms of downward. Mm-hmm. So they are gradually starting to inch back up as we see renewals of insurance and we see that the play of holding on to employees, their wages need to increase. The benefits of those their employees have been increasing. So, therefore, again... Typically, when the rates, when the volume stays low, the rates are going to be, you know, 
march in step with that, but we're mm-hmm. seeing rates are starting to see a, a gradual increase. So timing wise, you said, you know, a lot of times there's a, a little bit of a bigger bounce at a certain point. This one still feels like it's going to be sort of a gradual climb out. But when is that, uh, that gradual climb going to get to the point where we're no longer saying freight recession and bottom of the cycle and, you know, all that kind of stuff? Well, if I lived in Florida where the temperature is much nicer and uh, it's a bit sunnier outside versus single digits here today in Indianapolis. Yes. uh, Versus the single digits minus wind chill. My my attitude or I should say my thinking would be maybe a little bit brighter. Um, But (laughs) we have the curtains closed in here, too. We need some sun sun floating in. Yeah, that would be kind of nice as well. But. Being in the mindset that I am today, um, (laughs) I actually believe that I don't want to make the mistake that uh, we made in 2023 and say, okay, as soon as second half hits, we're going to see volume increases. I'm actually more under the thinking, and it's not just my thinking because I read a ton of stuff and we have a bunch of other information that comes in to us from our customers, our carriers, and other analysts that we work with in the industry to understand our market that we play in. And... We're thinking if there is going to be a an increase in volume, it's going to happen probably in the fourth quarter. But as we've done our planning, we're planning that 2024 is going to look like 2023. And if it just so happens that we do get that pickup in 2024, and it would be not a crazy volume pickup, it would be just, we would see a return of just a more normalized freight pattern, which is fourth quarter retail shipping, you start to see a little bit of a peak. You might see a little bit of constrained markets being called off if you play in the intermodal market, and you would start to see some surcharges there possibly, but nothing that would be crazy wild in terms of volume constraints. It would just be, you know, more just back to back to normal. Yeah. But in terms of actually seeing significant volume, we don't, we don't expect anything in the first half of the year and really through summer on that side. On the rate side, though, again, it's a little bit different. We're expecting that if you're if you're out there looking for contracts or you're out there trying to plan for the future and you're trying to manage your, your freight um, budget for 2024, our recommendation is make sure you get your contracts in. If you haven't and you're still playing the contract or you're still playing the spot market, get your contracts in here in the first quarter at some point in time mm-hmm. because we're gonna we're expecting the rates will do a gradual rise throughout this year, whether there's increase in volume or not. If there's increase in volume then, yeah, they're going to climb faster, but they are definitely going to climb. Yeah, that was one of the the later questions that I had. So it's been probably a pretty lucrative game to be playing that that spot market for a little bit longer than usual uh, for, yes. for a lot of folks. And, and I think that is something that a lot of shippers are wrestling with as you get to, especially the beginning of a new year, you are looking, especially the ones that do the calendar year versus the mid-year fiscal year kind of thing. You got to plan ahead. It doesn't look so safe anymore to expect those spot rates to stay super low. Yeah, the spot rates, as I said, the cost of doing business is is definitely higher than what it was. We're expecting to see more carriers drop out of the market, more brokers drop out of the market in the first half. Those ones, those carriers that have been able to carry themselves as far as they have, we expect that there's still a lot of slosh in, if, of excess capacity out there that is going to drive some other ones out of business, unfortunately. And that's when even when we're working with the small carriers that we, that we work with and, and they're asking us what to think, we're telling them the same thing. Plan as though 2024 is going to look like 2023. And if you have an upside surprise, you have an upside surprise. But it's better to plan for the worst and hope for the best than plan for the best and you get hit by the worst. <laughs> It's nice to be a little optimistic. Yeah, well, you know, though, as right? I said, I mean, it's minus like twenty degrees of wind chill <laughs> out there, and when you're taking the dogs out in the morning, and it, that's yeah, that, that definitely is a is a rude awakening to the day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean that that supply demand relationship that we talk about a lot in uh, the industry, the supply is what's going to be influencing rates probably more this year than the demand. Absolutely, absolutely. We talked, I think it was July or so last year, we did a a little mid-year check-in on things. So we already sort of evaluated our predictions back at that point. But one of the things you talked about a lot in that episode was the demand catalyst. Doesn't sound like we found the catalyst even six months later. Six months later, still looking for a catalyst. 
one of them that could be out there, there, there are some potential ones out there. One of them, and we've already talked about, is uh, a faster departure of carriers in the first half of the year. That might be a catalyst that's, that'll draw out supply that will end up pushing up rates a little bit faster. Again, demand won't be increased. Mm-hmm. On the demand side, we're at least not hearing from the Federal Reserve that they're interested in increasing rates any further. The only discussion now is how long are they going to hold out at these higher rates? And are we going to come in for a soft landing, a hard landing, or no landing at all? And depending on how that plays out, that could be the catalyst. Because as the interest rates come out, the housing market has been definitely hit because mortgage rates are much higher than what people are used to. Right. And so those people that own homes aren't interested in moving because they don't want to lose their low interest rates. And those that want to get in there um, on the housing market, the supply is limited and the price is pretty high. So mm-hmm. not if you want to pay high on the home and then on the rates, that no, no one wants to do that. <laughs> yeah. No one wants to do that. Even if they're living with their parents and this would be their first time around, they're still they're still going to want to live with their parents versus the other. Yeah. But that could be a catalyst if if it happens sooner in the year. Housing tends to punch above its weight because of all the additional things that you do once you get into that new house right. or that old house uh, or previously loved house, as my wife likes to call it. She never likes to call it a used home. I never liked existing homes because new ones exist, too. <laughs> you know, once, once they exist, they exist. Yes, once, they, 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 once they're up, they're up. So, um, <laughs> But there's so many other things that you want to add to the home to make it your own, even if it's a, well, I'll go with a previously loved home. Yeah. Um, so that's why it tends to punch up a little bit above its weight. If it's previously uh, unloved, then you might have to add more Then stuff. there's a lot yes. of love that needs to come into it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that has a potential catalyst to go ahead and jump in on there. Now, it's kind of interesting. I follow the stock market all the time. And there were actually two upgrades this morning, pretty significant upgrades on Home Depot and Lowe's, which says that a lot of analysts out there are thinking the home market is going to improve or at least it's going to, uh, the interest rates are going to be to a point that people would be interested in taking a loan out to do self-improvement on their homes. Mm, yeah. So that, that could help out some. In terms of other catalysts, it's not necessarily a positive catalyst in terms of, of volumes that would increase on volume side, but it is it would be a catalyst on some constraint options out there or situations out there that could cause price to go up and could cause capacity to be constrained in different areas. So, And those two, one is happening right now, and that's freight getting diverted around the Red Sea right. um, yeah. situation for the Middle East. So there's one that is driving some pricing on the ocean side, but it could also change in terms of how freight is moving in on the East Coast versus the West Coast because people would prefer to go in a different direction mm-hmm. with some of their freight. So that could drive up the West Coast in a plane. So that would be a constraint that could cause some problems. And then the other constraints that's out there, and it seems pretty likely that it's going to happen, is that the East Coast ports, which actually run from the East Coast all the way down into Houston and and actually into the Great Lakes, those port workers' contract, union contract, ends in October. And so that's the other part that could cause some constraints because as shippers read the tea leaves on this, they'll see that um, it's a little bit more than tea leaves at this point, but the union (laughs) head is saying to expect a strike. And based off of, granted, it was long and drawn out on the West Coast, but the eventual results for the strike that happened on the West Coast is the workers picked up some significant benefits and, and raises. So if if that's happened on the West Coast, the East Coast guys are going to say the same thing. Hey, I saw that this happened over here, so it took yeah. a strike to get those things to happen. And maybe the people on the other side of the table said, well, I saw what happened on the West Coast. This is going to be the end result anyway. Let's just go ahead and, and step to the step up to whatever. Of course, there's always going to be some back and forth on it, so they're not going yeah. to immediately <laughs> step up to it. No, but yeah. but that could cause some shippers to go ahead and and move some of their eggs back over to the West Coast, which then could cause some constrained markets uh, off the uh, West Coast ports. Yeah, because we saw all that uncertainty around the West Coast situation moved a decent amount of freight to those East Coast ports. So yes. Now they have to think about. You know, going back the other direction. Or at least spread it a little bit. Yeah, uh, uh, make it, even it out a little bit more. Even a little bit out a little bit more because some some uh, shippers did go ahead and do, well, I'm going to just go to the East Coast because I'm so tired of what happened in the West Coast. And I don't want that to ever happen to me again. Yeah. But there are a lot of people that went back and, and 
did a, a balance across. So it, we'll, we'll see, but that, that's definitely a catalyst that's out there. Again, not a volume catalyst, but something that would, could drive capacity shortages or constrain markets and, and see prices go up a little bit faster than what you would plan on based off of somewhat little increase on overall freight movement. How about the Panama Canal? Is that, you know, there's been some issues there in terms of depth and uh, and everything. Is it like where, how much do you think that influences things? Definitely influences capacity and, and where capacity could be played. Add that into the, you know, the Red Sea issue in terms of, you know, if you're trying to go across and then go over into the East Coast and then trying to take your freight, that's going to change that route significantly because they're not going to want to bypass the Red Sea. Then go through the Panama Canal because the, the option to bypass it is much longer. So again, that kind of plays into the West Coast port kind of side. So how much does all the ocean stuff, you know, the the import movement of uh, the ocean containers and everything, how much does that influence the domestic market in terms of when you get down to, you talked about obviously ocean rates have started to spike a little bit because of the, the Red Sea in particular, but how much does that trickle into the domestic, intermodal, and truckload and all that. Makes a big impact. I mean, over the course of, you know, several decades, we've seen more manufacturing being done out of the states, particularly in the Pacific Rim countries. And as that has moved out, we've lost manufacturing jobs and uh, and assembly jobs. So that really drives a lot of what happens in terms of our domestic freight based off of, you know, now you're bringing your product in through specific points of entry and those are the ports and because you can't just bring any ship on any yeah. you can't just roll up on a uh, well, we'll go back to florida we're not just going to roll up a ship on any beach there and just yeah. start throwing out freight mm-hmm. um you just can't do that and so that that definitely plays into the overall traffic patterns of, of how freight gets moved around into the, in the states now one of the areas that and i'm, I'm not sure if this was one of the areas we're going to cover or not but one of the areas that we do see not necessarily in 2024 as a catalyst, but it's definitely worth discussing is nearshoring because we're not necessarily seeing a lot of product being moved because it takes a lot of time to move your supply chains and for companies to move their supply chains around the world. But we are having lots of budgetary discussions as to where should I put my manufacturing facility? Because we are moving some of it. And where should we put it in Mexico? Should I put it in X, Y, or Z what has the best truckload support? What has the best intermodal support? So we are seeing the amount of traffic coming in to the east and west coast. It is going to change and it is going to start coming back through the U.S.-Mexico border. Mm-hmm. And to what level and when? We just know the level is going to be higher. Yeah. And we've had a few discussions over the past several podcasts with yeah, right. people talking about cross-border and all the different things that they're setting up and the, and the services they're setting up and the allegiances and the alliances and the ventures and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So there's a bunch. So we're not the only ones seeing that, that nearshoring is happening. We're all just not sure when it's actually going to hit in full force. Most likely not in 2024, although we're going to see some of uh, transitioning of truck to intermodal in 2024. So we're going to see some differences there. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall volume probably is not probably not until a 2025 type issue because it's going to be a gradual and then all of a sudden it's going to be there. Yeah, well, I, I mean, even the, the preparations start to make an impact too. I mean, just getting things set up down there, even if they're not actually moving the product yet, they're moving other stuff to set themselves up. Yes. You know, basically. Right. And, uh, you know, if you talk about the uncertainty issues with the, the Red Sea and the canal and whatever else comes out there uh, over the course of the next several months. I mean, already with, with a couple of those pieces in play and with the pandemic in uh, fresh in people's minds and everything with all the issues that occurred, you know, getting freight from China right. uh, over here, there's probably a little bit of an urgency uh, that, that could only get stoked a little bit more for some companies seeing all of the things that could still influence their supply chains that are, you know, far, far away from here. Oh, Absolutely. So that'll be interesting. I mean, uh, the cross-border thing is uh, is definitely, you know, we're not the only ones talking about it, but uh, we have been talking about it a decent amount just because, you know, there are a lot of people talking about it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So looking at the exits from the market before we leave that, one of the things that's been interesting uh, in the early part of this year and some of the other companies, I mean, we know Yellow, obviously, that was sort of its own animal in, in a lot of ways. 
we have a lot of the smaller carriers having issues. But one of the things that we've seen, and you mentioned it a little bit, the technology-based freight companies that had maybe exploded onto the market in the last few years, a few of them, even just in the last couple of weeks, have seen some big cuts. And then we saw a couple of others actually exit the market altogether. Why them in particular, do you think? Well, a couple of reasons, my opinion is, well, one of the biggest ones was Convoy, and that really put the yeah. uh, put the mark on the map saying that, you know, maybe the digital freight is, we're not quite there, or maybe maybe the technology's not there, maybe the, the carriers are not there, just maybe there's a whole bunch of stuff that's not there. Again, this is my, my opinion only, so take it for what it's worth, <laughs> but... A lot of what ends up happening when you get into those ventures, I mean, a, a lot of money gets thrown at it. And a lot of times the people that are throwing the money at it are putting the people that they trust the most because it is their money um, into those into those roles to develop that freight matching and the digital marketplace and not necessarily have those, the management, the C-level suite, again, my opinion only. So don't get mad at me if, if you don't like what I have to say, but... Over time, the freight market is in cycles, and it, and it always is in cycles. And if you haven't been through a few of them to understand the length that they could be and how deep they could be in terms of a downturn, and you're planning for, well, I can always do this, technology is always, always going to win, and your technology budget, and granted, you have to spend a lot of money on, our, on technology. I mean, 20% of our operating expenses associated with technology ourselves. So we spend a lot of money in technology also. But if you've got tech teams with full-time people that are always being thrown at this, and you're expecting that those volumes are always going to be there, and we even see this in even players in our market, we see that, you know, well, it's up and, you know, for whatever reason, we tend not to think about it's a cycle and it's going to go down. And even the people that are in the market for a long time, they sometimes miss it. But if you haven't been in it and you haven't been in through several cycles, you'll miss it. Mm-hmm. And you, you don't even know that it's, it even exists out there. And they also, they miss the fluidity of customers will pick up and leave for a nickel a mile or a penny a mile in some cases, depending on what customers you're working with. And I think that's the part that they, that, that was missed. And, and that, so their spend and their burn rate was significantly higher than what they expected. And they weren't accustomed to seeing those downturns in the market. So they didn't adjust the operations team in a timely enough manner. Or, you know, for some of them, as large as they were, they needed, they needed a certain amount of input to stay afloat. And, yeah. and it dropped so significantly that, you know, it, it would be tough even if you took out 50% to be able to take take care of that, particularly when they're still having that feed on, on the technology side. So in any case, I, I think that's what ended up happening. And there's rumors that others are going through that. You see some of the other technology driven, and we're a technology driven company too. I mean, that's even on our tagline, road, yeah. <laughs> technology driven road and rail solutions. And we've got several pieces of technology, but yeah, everyone's using technology almost at yeah, this point. Yeah, you, you have to. Degree. Yeah, <laughs> so to some degree you have to. And, of course, it, uh, technology is changing as well on, on AI, which is a topic that would uh, be great for another podcast down the road. But we're seeing that uh, some of the other ones that are still afloat, they've been making some pretty significant cuts. They made significant cuts over 2023, a couple big cuts at the end of 2023. I think Uber Freight just put out there that they cut some people. Um, unfortunately, they had to in, in January here. Yeah. And so, but again, we're it's not just a technology side, though. We're seeing that in, in other players as well. Other big brokers, I, I think, are kind of planning like we are at this point, which is plan for the worst and hope for the best because there's other larger brokerages that get the press that made some significant cuts in December. And then they also made some cuts right there here in July, July. I wish it was July is January, um, it, but it made some cuts here in January as well, because I, I think that they're feeling the exact same thing. Let's, let's, let's plan for the worst and hope for the best. So with all of that planning for the worst and hoping for the best, <laughs> is there anything that you could say that you are, um, excited for in 2024 (laughs) doesn't sound like it so far but maybe there's something that you've been hiding holding back on me okay so the part that i'm super excited over (laughs) is 2023 is over (laughs) which means that we are getting closer to the end and we'll see i I would expect that 2024 is it's it's a year in transition Mm -hmm. 
from going from a downturn to an upturn. And it's just a matter of when that upturn is going to be and, and, and continue to plan for it and, and plan for it some more. And continue to push out additional solutions. If you're a freight provider, look at for things that maybe you haven't done in the past, which I think that's kind of exciting. I know that in every upturn and every downturn, we bring in new services and, and, and look at shippers' freights a little bit differently each time that happens. And we always come up with additional solutions out of that. And then if you're a shipper, this is a great time to be planning. And uh, if you want to bring in technology with volumes being low, now is not a bad time to bring in technology. And the way technology is uh, the speed at which it can be implemented anymore it's still a, a good time to be able to do that and to be flexible and, and to plan for, you know, other contingencies that we just spoke about. You know, you've got the, the ports and, and different things that are sitting out there that are definitely going to be in play in some part. So I find that exciting to be out there and trying to figure out new things. Mm-hmm. And both shippers and freight providers definitely are in a position to continue to do that. Yeah, you know, we've got the election coming up, too. I mean, so there's there's a few predictable ones and then... There, there's always going to be a couple that we don't predict going yes. into the year. So hopefully positive non-predictions. Yeah, there we go. We'll go for super positive. <laughs> well, we'll continue to follow this, obviously, here. This is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, basically, of the discussion. There's plenty of weeds we could have gotten into. We didn't really get into uh, deep into the numbers on this one. But we'll continue to follow this here on the blog. Plenty of places for people to check out social media, everything like that, to see what we're seeing. And we like to share, so we won't keep We do a lot of sharing, absolutely. And and we'll bring in some other analysts to, not necessarily right now, but, you know, at the end of first quarter, I think that's going to tell us an awful lot. Mm -hmm. And that'd be a good time to to bring some of our our friends in and, and have some other conversations and see... At that point, I would think the tea leaves are getting a little bit stronger to read, and we'll be able to put our finger on something a little bit closer. We'll have been steeping for a few months there, so so yeah, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for InTech Freight and Logistics, the podcast. Check out the links in the description to learn more about everything we discussed. Subscribe or follow now to ensure you get our latest episodes as soon as they're available, and you can help us out by rating and reviewing us wherever you listen. If you have questions, email us at podcast at intechlogistics.com and visit intechfreight-logistics.com for more about what we do. For Rick Lagore, I'm Kevin Baxter. We'll talk to you next time.